Hello? Ready? Five? Okay. Hello, I'm Mary Palmer, a member of the League of Women Voters of the City of New York. Welcome to the debate amongst the well, Kansans for the Democratic Party for the 74th Assembly District. The candidates are Juan Bagan and incumbent Assemblyman Brian, Men, Brian Kavanaugh. Both candidates were invited to participate, and Assemblyman Kavanaugh is with us tonight to have a discussion about his district. So I just want to ask you some about the economy and how it pertains to your district. Um, more jobs have been lost in the public sector than the private sector, yet governments are suffering to reduce from reduced tax revenue. What can the state legislature do to improve the job situation in the city, particularly in the 74th district? Great, yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for the question and thank you for the opportunity to be uh -huh. here and for uh, agreeing to uh, moderate uh, today. Um, the, it's a very important point that a lot of what we've seen in terms of the contraction of the workforce has been uh, government employees. Obviously, the private sector has suffered uh, as well, particularly uh, the financial sector, which is a very important aspect of our economy here in New York. Uh, but it is important that if we want to maintain uh, jobs and economic activity, we make sure we maintain public spending, especially in a recession. Mm -hmm. um, locally, one of the biggest opportunities is uh, the New York City Public Housing Authority, um, which runs uh, programs partly because they're required to by federal law to ensure that local residents are able to be employed. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've been in promoting uh, and encouraging uh, Housing Authority to do that, and they've actually made some progress uh, on, on that. Uh, more generally, we do need to make sure that we keep our tax base uh, uh, able to both fund the services we need and that we're not cutting back unnecessarily. Um, it's important to make sure that we have a, uh, the tax burden is distributed fairly. Uh, state taxes in particular are very aggressive. Um, I have at times supported uh, tax increases, especially on uh, very high income individuals. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's an important aspect of the picture as well. Nice. Well, on the subject of housing, um, since you mentioned it in your answer, there's a shortage of affordable housing in the city. So given the lack of federal and state funding, what do you think the state legislature can do to stabilize the housing market? Uh, well, the first thing is that the state legislature, as you probably know, uh, is responsible for the rent stabilization system. And that is the principal means that we have as a public policy tool of ensuring uh, affordability for individual families and the stability of our communities. That system has been under uh, tremendous pressure. Um, it's basically been under assault by landlords and their allies and their lobbyists in Albany. And um, the last few times uh, before last year that it came up for renewal, uh, the system was weakened dramatically. Um, this time last year, for the first time, we strengthened it rather than weakening it in the uh, course of renewing the law. Having said that, uh, there are still uh, great loopholes in the system, and uh, it is still far too easy for landlords, especially in a, um, in a, in a healthy housing market where the economy gets better and, and more and more people want to live here and, and there's a greater ability uh, for people to pay rent. Uh, there is a tremendous temptation on the part of landlords to push people out of their housing so that they can charge more. Um, that again, both makes it harder for individual families to live in a community, to educate their kids in their community. It also destabilizes the community. Uh, I represent Stuyvesant Town in Peter Cooper Village, which was the subject of the largest residential real estate transaction in the history of the world at five and a half billion dollars. And the explicit plan of the people who purchased that property was to uh, evict virtually everybody who lived there and turn it into market rate housing. Uh, that's not right. Uh, the right thing to do for uh, our middle class communities is not the right thing to do for our city. So we need to continue to fight to strengthen that law. Um, we also I mentioned public housing. We have 18,000 public housing residents uh, within the 74th Assembly District, something like half a million around the city. Uh, that's as much housing as, uh, say, the entire city of uh, San Francisco. Um, and we need to make sure that's, that that system is preserved. Housing Authority has been under a lot of budgetary pressure for a lot of years. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked uh, in various ways to strengthen the finances of, of uh, Public Housing Authority. We had a, we had a uh, bill that went through both houses of the legislature that I was a sponsor of that uh, allowed literally a billion dollars over the next uh, few years to be uh, added to New York City Housing Authority's budget to cover the cost of, of state and city developments. Uh, we also had a deal to make sure that uh, the public assistance system is paying its fair share to public housing in the same way that it might uh, pay a private landlord who was providing housing. Um, 
but that system, you know, because of budget constraints and also because of some management issues that have been in the papers l lately, uh, is still uh, a difficult place to live. Um, it is a resource that we will lose over time uh, as, a, as an affordable housing resource if we do not uh, maintain it and strengthen the management. And so that's, that's been a very big priority representing so many residents for me in Albany. Thank you. Um, education, also related to the economy as well. Um, because of the crisis, education budgets have been slashed very severely. So opportunities for students are more limited than they have been over 40 years. Do you plan to put the educational needs of your constituents at the top of the priorities? Um, it's hard to put any one thing at the top of my priorities. <laughs> I, I think I already said housing has been a top yeah. priority, so I don't want to, by the time we're finished with our half hour, I don't have too many top priorities. <laughs> uh, but obviously what goes on in our schools is, is critical. Um, again, as you mentioned, it, for the economy and for you know the future of our democratic system, uh, to make sure we have an educated citizenry, a citizenry that can, you know, that, that if you graduate from our public schools in New York City, you are, uh, you are ready for high school, you are ready, ready for a job market that is changing rapidly over time, and you need you know, newer and different skills in some cases. So we need to make sure our school system is adapting to that, and we obviously need to make sure it has the resources uh, necessary uh, to achieve that. Um, I've worked very hard in my own district uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we have, we have very limited space. We have a lot of schools uh, sharing spaces. Sometimes it's important to get in there and make sure that uh, the different schools in the same building are all getting uh, the space they need. Um, and I've been involved in a couple of uh, very particular uh, cases where that needed to be mediated with some success of getting the DOE to do the right thing. Um, you know, in and, and longer term, we need to make sure that, uh, particularly in parts of our city, where the population is growing very dramatically. Uh, we need to make sure we're planning ahead. We need to make sure we're building the schools that we need in the places that we need. And again, we need to continue to focus on teacher quality and, uh, and you know, making sure that, that uh, it's that beyond the really basics of reading and writing and arithmetic, which are obviously important, that we have the resources to do, um, you know, to, to have a healthy environment to make sure that, you know, everything from the, the from physical education to uh, the food programs in the schools are, are well funded and healthy and, and, and appropriate uh, that and then also that we're not have it we're not reducing education to the basics there is a need for art there is a need for history there is a need for, for, for other subjects that you know perhaps aren't as easily uh, tested on aptitude tests but are really important part of a full and rich education uh, so I'll, you know I'll continue to to push uh, for the Department of Education to do those things, continue to push for adequate funding as I have uh, in, over the years, and uh, you know, hopefully we can continue to have the kind of uh, school system that, uh, that, you know, that we really need. Is that difficult with mayoral control? That system it has been reauthorized for seven more years, it, where it was in 2009. Is it difficult for you to have a large impact on public education? I, 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 just first of all, I think that uh, this mayor was, there were at least, uh, at least three mayors before this wanted uh, mayoral control of the cities. Um, it's, it's easy to forget that before this we had a board of education that where all of the members did their best, but having multiple elected officials appoint a board was really a recipe for lack of accountability. Um, in this system, for better or for worse, uh, if you like what's going on in the schools, you can credit the mayor. And if you don't like what's going on in the schools, you can, uh, to a substantial extent, blame the mayor. Um, and the, this mayor has said that and has accepted that, uh, that responsibility. Um, I don't always agree with this mayor on education or a variety of other issues. But I don't think having the Department of Education be a mayoral agency uh, is a problem in itself. I will say that probably we ought to make sure or that uh, it is accountable in the ways that other public agencies uh, are accountable. Uh, there is the, the, the city department of education, as it stands, is sort of a hybrid between a city agency and a state agency. I mean, I think there is some some work to do to make sure that we have uh, proper levels of community input and pr proper proper oversight of what they do. Having said that, I think that you know they they've had some successes. Uh, it is not, you know, our school system uh, has spent a great deal of money. Uh, there has been, you know, I mentioned there's a need for uh, more infrastructure and more skills, but the schools, but they have built a lot of schools. Um, they have, uh, we've very substantially improved the per student funding, uh, both at the, uh, system, the system level and at the individual uh, student level. Um, but I, I don't think, I think it's the appropriate uh, place for governance to be. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that we should continue to work within uh, a system that where basically it's, it's, it's a city agency and not a state or a, or a separate uh, entity. Thanks. 
All right, um, kind of talking about accountability. Oh, ethics has been a big story recently, as or kind of consistently. Mm -hmm. And um, the New York State Public Ethics Commission has been working over time these past few years. Two more legislators have been in the news last week accused of abusing the public trust and taxpayer money. What needs to be done to ensure the voters that the representatives will serve them honestly and responsibly? Uh, it's a good question. Um, we, first of all, I mean, there are a range of, we, we, we seem to be at the moment, uh, as, as you and I sit here, uh, talking about a couple of uh, scandals with particular uh, aspects, particularly troubling aspects of them. We're talking about people actually being assaulted uh, and, uh, you know, other improprieties. Uh, more generally speaking, we need to make sure we have a system where uh, incumbency is not, it does not come with so many protections that uh, you don't end up with a competitive system. We ought to have a system where uh, members of the legislature, whatever their party, and whatever their level of seniority, uh, there is a reasonable chance that the voters, if they become uh, unsatisfied with their, with their service, either because of uh, these kinds of scandals or more because of a more routine issues about how they're serving the community, it ought to be possible to replace them. That means we need a competitive system. We understand that incumbents are going to have a natural advantage in terms of people being familiar with them, but we certainly want to have a campaign finance system that levels the playing field and allows people uh, to compete. Um, we want to make sure that we have transparency so we know uh, where people are getting their money and where they're spending it. Uh, and we also need to deal with the more severe cases where people actually are accused of wrongdoing. We need to make sure that we have an open and transparent uh, process of investigating and uh, in some cases uh, coming to the decision that a particular legislator uh, is not, has violated the public trust and needs to go. Um, I don't want to comment on the particular uh, situation now. We have several uh, ethic, uh, administrative and criminal investigations going on and you know I think it is important to get the facts out there but obviously if some of these facts are true uh, certainly you know, one or more of my colleagues should be uh, resigning. Thank you. On campaign finance, do you favor reforming campaign financing rules at the state level by significantly lowering limits on contributions to candidates and to housekeeping accounts of political parties? And would you support a system similar to the one established by the Campaign Finance Board in New York City? Yes. Uh, I've made it a big priority uh, to work on these issues. I personally have accepted a lower limit than the law would require for my own re-election campaigns, uh, just unilaterally. Uh, I've also sponsored uh, numerous uh, pieces of legislation, some of which deal with particular uh, gaps and loopholes in the system. Uh, there's this, there are, just for example, uh, if you form uh, an LLC, a limited liability company, uh, that limited liability company becomes a separate contributor from the perspective of our current campaign finance laws, which means if you form a hundred of them, you can give a hundred checks to a politician uh, basically entirely on your say-so with your money. Um, obviously, loophole, loopholes like that need to be closed if you're going to have any integrity in the system. But you also do need to lower the limits. Uh, there are seven states in the U.S. that do not have contribution limits at all, but among those with contribution limits, ours are by far the highest. So even without a public financing system, uh, we ought to lower those limits and make them uh, more like the amounts of money that normal uh, citizens can give uh, to support their politicians. But the, goal, the ultimate goal, especially given uh, the state of affairs that, uh, uh, that the Supreme Court has set out for us in terms of uh, the restrictions on what we can do uh, to rein in spending, uh, the, you know, the general uh, conclusion we can come to from, from the court decisions is that the system needs to be voluntary, meaning you need to provide public financing in order to uh, induce candidates to agree voluntarily to accept limits on their spending and to accept uh, certain contribution limits and certain disclosure uh, requirements. Um, the city system works well. I ran actually in 2005 under the city system and participated and you know I think it was, it was, it was a good experience. Just to give you an example, in that race there were 11 candidates who ran, seven of them made the ballot and uh, five of us qualified for public matching money. So it does have the um, effect that I was talking about before of making elections more competitive. It also does have the effect of reducing uh, the dependence of candidates and elected officials on big money contributors. And, that, and both of those things are very positive and we should implement that at the state level. Yes. All right, um, speaking of, let's see, let's switch a little bit to the environment. 
talk about hydraulic fracturing. Do you favor introducing high volume hy horizontal hydraulic fracturing in New York? Um, what legislation is needed to ensure the safety, manage cost, and protect New Yorkers? And should there be a federal legislation introduced since natural gas supplies cross state lines? Um, uh, I'll take them backwards, uh, take them in reverse order. First of all, this, order, this order is order. an issue that should have been dealt with a long time ago at the federal level. We have a national energy market. Obviously, there are regional aspects to it, and you know, gas does have to you know, travel from its source to where it's burned. Um, so there are regional and state level issues. But clearly, if you're going to have an industry like the oil and gas industry, uh, there ought to be standards at the federal level that ensure that the practice is safe. Um, so you ought, it's, it's issues of how of safety at the sites for the workers and for people who might be around there, uh, issues of how, how you deal with spills, issues of how you control air quality, water quality, all of these things uh, ought to have been a long time ago uh, the subject of some stringent regulations at the federal level. Had we done that, we may have figured out an important question, which is, is it possible to do uh, drilling on a large scale with large volumes of fracturing fluid in a way that would be safe? My view of the current state of affairs is that nobody has demonstrated that this practice can be done safe anywhere it's been practiced in the United States or abroad. We have certain we have countries uh, around the world that have uh, declared moratoria or banned the practice. Uh, we've had numerous uh, instances in the United States of very serious safety concerns, very serious pollution concerns. Unfortunately, some states went forward uh, with this very substantial new industrial process as if it was your run-of-the-mill uh, gas well without any new regulations at all. And they've seen uh, some very negative results from that experience. In New York, uh, we've, it, to the credit of the executive branch, and we're talking about across several governors now, uh, we have had a long-term and uh, very uh, complex process of reviewing uh, the circumstances under which this could be done safely and putting forth uh, proposals uh, for making it safer. Um, those have been done in draft form. Uh, I and many other people have commented on that. I, I do not believe they have shown us that this could be done safely uh, anywhere in New York State. And uh, so at this point, I'd have to say, given what I know about the technology and given uh, what I've seen of uh, proposals for to try to make it safe, I don't believe it can be done safely and we shouldn't be moving forward. Moreover, uh, going down this road, there is an opportunity cost. If we are going to decide to roll out a massive new industrial scale energy production uh, capacity in New York State, we ought to be thinking about whether burning another fossil fuel or burning it and drilling for it in a new way, a new and somewhat destructive way, um, and is is really the right way right way to go. We know that at the end of the day, we are going to need to f develop alternative energies that don't pollute. Uh, we're talking about solar and wind and tidal and a variety of other things, uh, and the kind of activity and, and focus that has been invested in this question of whether uh, we should be drilling for gas in this new way and whether we should be doing pipelines and all the other issues that come with it uh, would be better spent on a really aggressive effort uh, in New York State and throughout the United States of doing what many other countries are doing, which is ret retooling their economies so that they can uh, rely on fuels that have, uh, rely on energy sources that have no fuel costs, that have no uh, meaningful emissions, and that are just safer and, and more sustainable in the long term. Thank you. All right, you've already mentioned. I think I want to talk, ask you one more question about immigration before I allow a couple moments for you to give a closing statement. Um, the vice president, excuse me, the president via executive orders decreed that certain qualified undocumented immigrants can file for a temporary legal status. Do you feel that the state will benefit from the new federal undocumented immigrants plan? And do you feel the state has a role in determining immigration policy? Um, I, I think that the state uh, will benefit. Uh, I think, in fact, in New York City uh, in particular, uh, we have a very long-standing uh, commitment to supporting a rational immigration policy for this country. And by rational, I mean a policy that allows the level of immigration that is appropriate for a, an expanding economy, 
uh, that is appropriate for a society that has always based its, uh, you know, our, our, our most basic principles revolve around an acceptance of diversity, an acceptance of newcomers. Uh, and New York City, uh, even when the last, the last time uh, immigration policy uh, was uh, made more restrictive uh, at, the, at the congressional level, you had a situation where a Republican mayor at the time was lobbying a Democratic president at the time to veto uh, the Immigration Reform Act, which was basically to making, making immigration much more restrictive uh, in the United States. So now we're in a situation where we have an overly restricted immigration policy. Uh, we have many people here who are undocumented. In this case, we're talking about people who, in many cases, came here when they were very young. Um, no, one, no one affected by the president's policy would have come to the United States before the age of 16. It was generally wasn't their choice to be here. These are, they are in families that are contributing to our economy already, contributing to our society, paying taxes, doing jobs, and in, in many cases, enrolled in our schools. Um, it is important that we uh, find a human main way of addressing that, and certainly New York and really everywhere that embraces uh, that kind of diversity and, the, and, and newcomers will benefit in the way that our country has for many years. Thank you. I'd like to give you a few moments, if you, about a minute and a half, two minutes, really, as long Great. as you'd like, just to. Yeah. So this, this election is happening in a context where uh, we have many uh, difficult choices to make nationally and here in our state. Uh, and, uh, you know, while there's a lot of attention to, uh, you know, questions about at, at the federal level about whether, whether they're getting the right president and the right Congress, we need to remember that a lot of what is important about government, a lot of what is important about the way we organize a society is decided at the state level. Um, we've talked about some of the issues. We've talked about housing. We've talked about environmental protection. We've talked about uh, making sure that we have uh, humane policies, making sure that we have uh, an education system that works. All of those things, for better or for worse, are going to uh, be decided substantially at the state level. Uh, I'm somebody who's worked very hard uh, in my district and in Albany uh, to fight for what's right, to make the system responsive to the needs of ordinary people. Um, I do hope to be able to continue that work, and so I hope anyone out there who might be voting in the 74th Assembly District who's listening today will consider voting for me on Thursday, September 13th, the unusual uh, Thursday primary that we're having in a week and a half. Uh, th and thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Um, just to break up a little bit about the 74th State Assembly District. The district covers the east side of Manhattan from the 40s down to the Williamsburg Bridge and represents over 136,000 residents. And the winner of this primary may face a challenger in the November 6 elections. So if you are enrolled in the Democratic Party and there's a primary election in your district, you vote next Thursday, like you mentioned, Assemblyman, next Thursday, September 13th, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., the polls will be open. For information, you can contact the League of Women Voters of the City of New York. You can check out their website, www.lwvnyc.org, or give them a call. There is a telephone information service available from between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. every day. 212-725-3541 and we have um, choosing the president available in English and Spanish as well as palm cards to let you know about anything you have for the elections and that is all. four minutes all right actually we have a little bit more time did you have anything else you wanted to say or um well uh <laughs> Another, actually, we have one issue we haven't talked about is gun policy. And uh, this is something I've spent a lot of time working on. Uh, I am uh, the co-chair of something called State Legislators Against Illegal Guns, which is an unusual thing in Albany. It is a bipartisan uh, organization of legislators who agree that we need sensible gun policy here at the state level and around the country uh, to make sure that we have policies, again, that will prevent illegal guns from getting into the wrong hands uh, and reduce the kind of violence we've seen. Um, it is, so we have uh, a number of priorities, and again, now I'm not speaking, not speaking for the group as a whole, but um, from my perspective, uh, we need to do things, com we need common sense policy changes to make sure that, uh, that again, people who are, have mental health issues that have been adjudicated to be, uh, you know, 
people who should not have a gun in, in their hands, or certainly people who are violent felons who are currently prohibited from having guns. Um, we still we continue to live in a country where those folks it's entirely too easy to get to get guns. Many of the guns originate from outside our state, as we know, but a lot, upstate in particular, most of the gun guns that are used in crimes originate in New York State. So we need uh, tougher restrictions on uh, who can work in gun stores, including background checks for, for people who work in so sort of remarkable, but you can actually work behind the counter in a gun store without the sort of background check that would be necessary if you're on the other side of the counter. Um, we, need, we need something called micro stamping, which permits uh, a, the police could, to trace the gun that was used in a crime to its original purchaser from a single uh, shell casing that's found at a crime site. Um, we also need to make sure that uh, we close uh, various loopholes that are that are frequently uh, used by people who want to traffic in guns. So for example, uh, you should not be able to buy un unlimited uh, numbers of guns. Uh, you know, somebody who needs a gun to defend their home does not presumably need to be buy 20 in a month. Um, you should not uh, be you should not be able to sell a gun in the private market without uh, that being registered and without there being some mechanism to make sure that the purchaser of the gun uh, is not a prohibited purchaser. Uh, so these are issues we're working very hard on here. Um, obviously, uh, there are, you know, there are other states need to, need to do their part, and the federal government needs to do its part. But it is important to recognize that we're you know we're not uh, we're not entirely uh, where we need to be even at the state level, and and that's something I've worked very hard on. All right, thank you. We have few moments, okay. just about one minute. So if you want to briefly tell us about um, just New York and their voter, I'm sorry, actually, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Okay. So <laughs> again, like I said, for voter information, you can contact the league. And thank you very much, Assemblyman Kavanaugh, for coming and having this conversation with us. And go out to the polls next Thursday if you are enrolled in the Democratic Party and eligible to vote in the 74th Assembly District. Great. And thank you again. Thank you. Yeah.